Hello, and welcome to Marketing to Complex Industries, presented by Godfrey, a B2B marketing agency for industries like yours. On each episode, we feature conversations about the latest challenges, strategies, and technologies for B2B marketers. My guest today is Melissa Einfrank. Melissa is a senior PR manager with Godfrey. She's been with us for about 10 years, uh, but has a PR career that goes beyond that. Uh, she's been in the business for about 15 years and has had a variety of experience between B2C and B2B. Uh, she's walked both red carpets and factory floors. She's worn sunglasses and safety glasses, all in pursuit of serving her clients. We're excited to have her today to talk about PR trends and what we can be looking forward to over the next year. Hi, Melissa. Welcome to the podcast. We're glad to have you here. Thanks for having me, Scott. I'm excited to be here. So we're here to talk about the latest hot topics in public relations. Um, tell me a little bit about how you would describe PR in general. That's a great question. It's a question my parents have asked me many, many times because I think it's one of those hard things to wrap your head around. It's not like you're a lawyer or a doctor or whatever. It's, you know, what is a, what is a PR professional? So I've gotten that question a bunch from my family. But if I had to boil it down to like three main things, I would say it's all about connections. Mm -hmm. So connecting with your audiences, your clients' audiences, and telling them relevant stories and providing them with content um, that makes them think, okay, this could be useful. This could be helpful to me. I want to learn more. So it's really that top end of the funnel, the marketing funnel. It's really about awareness. Um, another thing that is an important aspect to PR is relationship building. So we build relationships with the editors we work with, our clients, and influencers, because we want to be that trusted source for them. So they know if they're on deadline and they're writing a story, they know they can come to Godfrey. Um, we're, we're proactive, we're, we get back to them quickly, and we, we get them that important content that they need. Um, but tactically, though, it can, you know, every day changes, which is why I love it. Um, no two days are the same. Um, one day you could be planning an event. Um, pitching editors, reaching out to influencers, writing. So it really runs the gamut, which is why it's a lot of fun. Now you mentioned influencers and that's, uh, that's a term that gets used a lot. That's a, a term that, um, that I, I think sometimes um, people may misunderstand uh, because it, it has become so ubiquitous. Tell me a little bit about how you define what an influencer is and how that kind of marketing is, is different uh, than, than other types of, of PR and marketing? Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think when people think of influencers, especially, you know, when we, we bring this up to clients a lot, we have a lot of conversations about influencer relations. And I think where people's head usually goes first is influencers. Isn't that just for B2C? They think like Kim Kardashian or, you know, the, the fashion influencers, but really anyone who has a respected following, who shares important information that people trust, that's an influencer. So for B2B, it could be a contractor, a distributor, it could be a university professor who does a lot of research in a certain area. Um, it could be um, an analyst. So there's a lot of different people out there that are influencers. Um, that we just want to build relationships with. And I think, you know, there's a whole process when you're engaging with influencers that's important to follow as well. So it really is about about building up that sense of credibility uh, so that you've, you've sort of got that capital. And then when people hear you suggest something or uh, or endorse something, they're going to be more likely to, to take some confidence with that. Yeah, it's like a it's a trusted third party source. So that's why people um, look to influencers to help them with their their research, their buying decisions, um, and that kind of thing. How have you seen the role of the influencer and the role of of just the PR professional evolve over the past year with the pandemic and all of the challenges that's thrown our way? 
Yeah, the pandemic definitely has brought its challenges for everybody. Um, and PR is no different. I mean, everything's moving towards online anyway, and it's been going that way for so many years. I think the pandemic just really reiterated that, you know, everything is really digital. Um, you know, news is happening so fast that people are getting their content online. Um, trade media, they're influencers, of course. They're part of the influencer network. So people read their content um, to get information. And what we're finding with the trade editors um, is that, you know, like a lot of other people, they're doing more with less, less resources. So they're really looking for more content from us, from our clients, um, which is something we're definitely working with them on. Um, and things are moving more virtual. You know, we can't do those face-to-face -face events like we used to. So we're just pivoting to different virtual events. Well, I think there's a lot that you touched on, a lot to talk about there. Um, how how are you staying in touch with trade editors these days? Has it has that altered at all? No, we've mostly um, been, you know, emailing. So that hasn't really changed. Um, we did deploy a survey over the summer um, to, I think it was about 500 trade editors that we work with just to get like a sense of how the pandemic has shifted their way of working, how we can work with them better. Um, and really the main thing was email is best for them. They're, they're super busy, they prefer email. Um, and you know when we're pitching them, make it like short, concise to the point, so, you know, they're, they're so busy. So we just want to be a helpful resource to them. And that's really what we strive to do every day. Yeah. The, uh, the executive summary is something uh, that in, in many communications I've come to really deeply appreciate because so often we have to get up to speed on things quickly. I mean, this stuff is just continuing to, to change and evolve and move. And, and so to, uh, to look at the, at the, the quick, like, high level drive by view is is really important. Yeah, and I think they really appreciate press releases. So sometimes, you know, you've heard the press release is dead. Well, according to the survey, that's not the case at all. They really appreciate the press release because like you said, it's kind of like an executive summary. It's the high points, what they need to know about this new product, service, whatever it may be. So, um, you know, just giving them what they need in an in, in a in a way that's really digestible is yeah. really important to them. You know, I, I think uh, you mentioned talking to your family and that kind of thing, explaining what you do. And, um, and I think that for those of us in B2B, it's kind of interesting because when you tell people that you're in PR, um, I, I think that there's, there's a really interesting connotation that's there in terms of, uh, you know, being somebody who, who gets the word out um, kind of has that, that uh, stereotypical megaphone you know, so to speak. Um, but also I, I think that there can sometimes be kind of a, kind of a, a sort of cynical view of PR because we increasingly know when we're being advertised to, we know that things get spun. And, uh, and so a lot of the PR folks uh, in, in entertainment in politics, that kind of thing. I mean, there's, there's a lot of times a very one-sided view. How does that compare to, to B2B and to like the industrial sector? Yeah, I mean, you're definitely right. There's a lot out there that maybe makes me cringe sometimes when I see it, um, because that's not the PR that we do here. Um, the PR we do here is it's it's about sharing information. It's about being helpful, um, and that's really how I see it. It's it's providing content and stories that people care about. Um, the audiences that we're trying to reach, what do they care about? What keeps them up at night? Um, how can we and our clients make their lives easier? And how do I get that message to them? That's, I would say that's like the crux of what we do. Do you have, uh, do you have any examples that come to mind of a time that felt particularly gratifying to you, uh, in that you had some influence or, or, or made like a, a positive impact in a PR situation that just, just felt really meaningful. Yeah. Um, 
So part of what we do at Godfrey is media training. Um, and I'm part of that team that does media training for clients. And I, I love when you go into the media training, you start with people who may not have any experience being in front of a camera and we do different immersive exercises. So the first one that we do, they're typically like a little nervous or, you know, they feel awkward about it. And it's a, it's about a three to four hour training that we do. And by the end, they're all like rock stars and they do such a great job. And then when you see them later in the media at a trade show and you see them like shine, it's such a great feeling. So I love that. Well, and I, I can say, um, that's, I think, I think the training I went through one, I think it was maybe four hours long Mm -hmm. and I, I walked in thinking I was pretty savvy about this kind of stuff. And I was really surprised at how hard it was, even though I knew that I was in the office, I was with people. I knew, uh, the curveball questions and stuff totally pulled me off track. And I really understood, uh, much better how the principles that you were teaching, uh, were very important because, uh, especially when you're, you're talking to the media, it's very easy to get, uh, to go down a rabbit trail, to get pulled off topic, uh, you know, understanding your talking points and, and how to stay on them, uh, clearly and effectively and honestly is, uh, is, is really a learned skill. It is. It's not easy. And the people that make it look really easy are the people that have so much practice and experience and, you know, even the people that you're like, wow, they're so good in front of the camera. They must, you know, they prepare like a lot (laughs) before those interviews. So, um, it's, it's a cool, it's a cool thing to see people who, you know, at the beginning aren't so comfortable, get really comfortable in front of the camera. And yeah, that's definitely a gratifying, um, experience. So I think, and especially you know, going back to, to uh, you know, sort of PR in the age of the pandemic and, and with the, uh, the technological advancements that, that everyone has adopted very quickly just in order to continue to, to do business, um, it really does feel like it's easier than ever to reach people directly. Um, one group that marketers sometimes don't think to include in their outreach efforts are their own employees. And we're at a, at a place now, and I even know with Godfrey working remotely, uh, we've, we've done some very interesting things to, to try to stay connected to one another as, as we're doing the work. Um, what are some steps that people can take? What are some steps that, that maybe our, our customers or our listeners could take uh, to build out employee advocacy you know, as, as part of their, their PR portfolio? Yeah, I mean, it- like you said, the pandemic, it can be very isolating for people. Everyone's working from home. So connection is really important. Um, You know, when you're rolling something out, it's always important, obviously, to go to your employees first um, and tell them about it, why it's important, why they should care. And part of employee advocacy is really getting your employees to promote the company that they work for, your company. Um, So identifying those individuals at your company who are super passionate about what you do, the company can be a great tool um, to use in promotion efforts, whether it be um, recruiting or, you know, rolling out a new website or what have you. So I think, you know, the steps that people can take, identifying those people, working with them on their social platforms. So if they're really active with um, LinkedIn, you know, have them share the content that you're sharing on your company page. Um, have them talk to people. Um, I know that's something that Godfrey, we do a lot. Um, there's a lot of people that post on, on LinkedIn about what we're doing, um, you know, what our clients are doing. So it's a great way to get that word out. I think uh, it's really easy for people to get overwhelmed when they start to think about social platforms and that kind of thing. And, you know, I mean, for every, uh, for every employee you have at your, at your company, you're going to have some slightly different, um, you know, sort of social media cocktail in terms of what they do. Like, uh, you know, being an artist and a designer, I spend a lot of my time on Instagram and probably secondarily LinkedIn because, you know, of, of just the professional network. 
Um, and everybody's a little different. So with, with, uh, with everything that's out there, you know, uh, from, from the ones I mentioned to Facebook, which is, is, you know, one that many people are familiar with and active on to newer things like TikTok and clubhouse and, and those sorts of things. How do you go about selecting the right platforms or do you recommend an approach where people just do a little bit in everything? It's important to make sure it's authentic to the company. So if, you know, TikTok not, might not be the appropriate platform for a B2B company, but LinkedIn might very well be the right place because that's where your audience is. Yeah. So don't just jump on the bandwagon because TikTok's the new thing and you want to do something funny, you know, if it, if it matches your brand and your company culture, then great. But if it doesn't, I would say, don't do it just to do it. Yeah. I think, um, you know, if I were thinking about it from a branding perspective, I would, I would say from a strategy standpoint, we would want to look at where your, where your current customers are, where do they live and also your prospective customers. And a lot of times those are going to be the same, the same places, right? You're going to have, yeah. you're going to have a couple of personas, a couple of, a uh, couple of specialty groups that you're going to really be targeting. And, uh, and you can, you can get data on, on where they're likely to be hanging out. Sometimes I think it may surprise people. Um, but yeah. yeah, that's, that's where we would end up pulling in, um, probably our, our social media person and one of our strategists, right. To, exactly. to sit down and, and talk about that and do some, some deep dives. Mm -hmm. Um, but would you say, I would say it's not an exact science. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think it's a lot of trial and error. Um, I think that's true of a, a lot of what we do. Um, we do AB testing, um, you know, with creative and it's the same for PR. I mean, when we're reaching out to influencers, there's a lot of trial and error. So you first want to make sure you're doing your research who's the most appropriate person to reach out to, why. And then once you identify somebody, you need to listen to do the social listening. What do they post about a lot? What do they care about? What are their, their readers, their following? What do they care about? Um, and then you start sort of reaching out and building that relationship. It shouldn't just be here. I have something for you. Um, you want to make sure it's a win-win. You don't want to just ask for things. Um, so it's really a lot of trial and error with, with influencers specifically, um, for the PR world. So, you know, I think that's a, a good point that you brought up. I would, I would imagine that, uh, from experimentation, well, I, I would think people, I would think a lot of companies would probably, uh, allocate a certain percentage of their time to experimenting with that kind of thing. Uh, and really just seeing what works. Right. And, mm -hmm. and it's nice because I mean, you have immediate analytics, you can see how something is trending or uh, how many, how many views it's gotten, how many likes it gets um, you know, whether the comment section is blowing up or, or anything like that. Um, so it, it seems like something where you could allocate a percentage of your efforts to experimentation and then, and put, put the bulk of it into stuff that you know is, is tried and true. Yeah. I mean, I really view um, influencer relations as like the next step in media relations. So I mentioned before media or trade media, they're influencers too. Mm -hmm. So it's just sort of stepping a little outside of that circle and finding other people who are also influential. So I really see it as like part of the media relations program, but just sort of the next step. I'm interested in how you can identify people like that, because I remember, um, I think it was 2017. I went to con expo out in Las Vegas and that's, um, you know, the, the arguably, I, I think one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, construction trade show in the world, it's, it's pretty big. And, um, I actually got to go see Mike Rowe from dirty jobs speak, and he's been an advocate for, um, you know, industrial jobs and the kinds of, of you know, trades and things where uh, people are, are actually sorely needed. There's a, a skills gap right now. Um, and I, I was, um, it was very interesting to be in that crowd with those folks, with that audience when he came out. I mean, it was, it was like they were seeing Mick Jagger, right? They, they absolutely went bananas and I'm like influencer. Wow. Okay. That, that really made sense to me. How do you go about finding other people 
uh, because he he's at that upper level, right? Where he's a household name. Yeah. Um, not everybody is that way, but there are people who can wield a lot of influence, I'd guess, without being so uh, ubiquitous. Yeah, they're they're called micro influencers. So they have the smaller following, but their following is super relevant to who you're trying to reach. Um, there's a lot of different tools out there that we can use to to find those influencers. Um, BuzzSumo is one of them that we use at Godfrey. And then just like simple um, like YouTube searches, you know, just really going down the rabbit hole of research online to try to find the people yeah. that have something to say um, and, and have a, you know, really big, you know, following within the industry you're trying to target. Um, so there's a lot of different tools. We use Cision as well. Um, but that's more on the editorial side. So BuzzSumo is one that we're um, digging into a lot at Godfrey. Yeah. So uh, let's let's get into the 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 shoes of someone who is uh, you know working in marketing at uh, at a, at a company. Let's say that they've had you know fairly steady growth over the last 20 or 30 years. They haven't done a whole lot of marketing. They haven't done a whole lot of PR, uh, but with the disruptions from, from COVID and also with just the changing media landscape, the changing technological landscape, they're starting to see the need to really amplify, really get their message out there. How would you recommend somebody like that get started? Because I would imagine it can feel overwhelming. Yeah. I, I think that's a great question, Scott. I think, you know, I'm a big pen and paper gal. I like to make lists. So that's maybe one one way to start is just make a list. What's what's coming up for the year? Do you have product launches? Do you have, um, you know, big announcements that are coming down? And try to calendarize them. That way it's easier to, to dive in. It's not so um, like consuming where you're, concerned, like, how am I going to get started? So I would say make a list, calendarize it. And then also, you you know, at a company, it's great because you have all of these subject matter experts, you know, at your fingertips. So the next thing I would do is, is reach out to people and try to find out those really interesting and cool stories. So, you know, I call that content mining, um, story mining, um, you're looking for that diamond uh, of a story and you're trying to, um, you know, people might think, oh, this isn't a story. But once you start talking to them, you're like, no, this is really interesting. We should get this news out there. So I would say those are the first two steps I would take um, when diving into a PR program. Yeah, when um, when we gave a talk recently at... Um... I think it was the, the talk that we gave it at Marketing Profs uh, about a year and a half ago. One of the things that we were talking about was listening to people within your organization, really getting to know what goes into their jobs. And sometimes that just helps you connect at a human level, but sometimes it gives you the opportunity to be wowed, right? And to really stoke a, a sense of wonder because something that is uh, is a, a job day in and day out for someone that is mundane and routine for them might be amazing. And they just don't see it because it's very familiar. Exactly. Um, and that, that I think that that comes along with expertise. So I, I would say that that person in marketing, from, from what you're telling me, they would be in that position to, to be wowed and then to, to pass that along. You know, there's, there's your, your story. You've got, you've got your hook. Basically. Exactly. Yeah. It's all about connections. It's all about, again, like bringing it back to what we talked about at the beginning. It's all about connection and relationship building. And if you can get that down, you can find those stories, those great ideas come from collaboration and connecting with people. Um, that's how great things happen. Looking at, at some of the other things that I think people uh, maybe find intimidating, uh, we are also in an era where because of the ubiquity of social media, the speed with which news spreads, we're, we're in an era where it can feel like a real minefield, I think. Um, talk to me a little bit about what to do in, in crisis mode. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I'm, we could probably do a whole separate 
separate podcast just about that. Um, but I'm, but I'm interested, like, you know, we've heard the stories about somebody tweeting a joke and getting on a plane. And by the time they land, they've been fired and mm-hmm. their, their life is, is, it feels like it's over because of some insensitive thing that they said or did. Um, I, I think, you know, companies are rightfully, you know, concerned about, about what, what happens with bad press, but talk to me a little bit about, um, how to be ready for a crisis and how to manage one once it erupts. Yeah. Um, so that's really in the realm of reputation management, which is something, again, it's, it's another big trend. People are talking about it a lot in the industry. We're talking to our clients about it. So I think that the big key thing with reputation management is to make sure you're proactive. So you don't want to just react when something happens, like when something negative happens, you want to be on top of your reputation. I mean, reputation is the most important thing Um, personally. And then for a brand, um, you want that trust. So be working on your reputation every single day. You want to be that company that is on top of customer complaints. Um, You're helpful. And you're, you're putting, you know, with your social media efforts, you're very authentic and um, true to yourself. So then when something negative does happen, you've had this established um, online reputation management program, and you can quickly react and and make it right. Um, Having a plan in place is obviously something you would want to have ahead of that. So, you know, there's crisis communications plans, there's, you know, a lot of things you can do to be ready should something really negative happen. I mean, everyone, you know, reputation management is a big deal, especially now. I mean, Scott, can you think of an example of when maybe something wasn't going right with a company you were dealing with maybe personally and you tweeted them and then they fix it right away? I mean, I'm sure lots of us have examples of that, right? Um, Airlines and phone companies mostly. (laughs) I would do the same thing with a travel company too. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So it's just like that. They have good um, customer service people who are on it, who are who are looking at, um, you know, their online platforms and are taking the, the proper steps to make it right. Um, Zappos does a really good job of that, too, um, the shoe company. Um, so it's just really about maintaining a positive reputation. Should something bad happen, you're on it and you can fix it and and move forward. I think that 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 level of connectivity is uh, is truly amazing, and one of the things that um, that was really impressed upon me er- early on is that uh, platforms like Twitter, uh, for all the challenges that we're seeing uh, because of of you know people just being either either immature or or downright mean. Um, but there's also that level of connectivity with, with people everywhere. And, uh, it, one of the first interactions that I had was, uh, we were on a business trip out in Milwaukee and I found out there was a bronze statue of Fonzie down by the waterfront. And I was like, I'm going to see Fonzie. I tweeted a picture, I tagged Henry Winkler in it and he wrote me back. And it was like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's, it's like getting a fan letter answer. Right? I, got, I got tweeted by the Fonz. That's awesome. Um, and so it was, it was a little thing, but it, it, it really drove home. This was years ago. It just drove home to me how connected we really are. And if you are creative enough or eloquent enough, or just in the right place at the right time, you can, you can actually make some pretty significant connections. I would imagine that that would be the the same with, uh, with potential customers as well. Absolutely. I mean, being in, in front of them and then answering questions quickly makes a huge difference. It makes it makes the customer feel like you actually care as a company. Um, and, and that's, I think, what you want. You want to be that that resource for people and then that creates loyalty. I think loyalty is a big part of it. And, and uh, one little interaction can create years of loyalty or it can probably do the opposite. It could, it could, it could most likely wreck it if it's, if it's not good. Yeah. One bad interaction where you feel like, okay, this company's not hearing me. Yeah. You probably wouldn't want to be a repeat customer. Yeah. I I think that in the last 12 months uh, we've seen this become an even more important 
um, aspect. I mean, you've, you've dealt with a lot of it. We've mentioned trade shows at least twice so far on the podcast here. Um, you've done a lot with trade shows, a lot with event marketing. That's, that has got to be super different. Um, you know, I, I know that I've, I've done a couple of, of talks that would have been in person. I would have actually traveled, uh, to go do those presentations and we've just done them virtually. Talk to me a little bit about all of those typically in-person, you know, PR efforts and what changes you've seen and well, I'll have follow-ups as well, but yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about, about how people are compensating for that right now. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's definitely, um, you know, a huge, it has a huge impact on people, um, with, you know, not being able to be face to face. So again, I think trade shows are a great way to connect with people. Um, we talk about connection a lot, um, but it is, it's a great way to be in front of somebody, a customer and have like a a face to face conversation. I think people are getting a lot more comfortable with zoom. Um, as a result of this pandemic, I think you probably have many Zoom calls a day, as do a lot of our, our clients. Um, and, you know, it's definitely not the same as face to face, but I think you can make it so um, you can make it really, um, you know, impactful when you deliver news or um, you're having a conversation with a customer via zoom it's definitely not the same though as an actual trade show so people are pivoting so you hear that word a lot i think the main word for 2020 was you're on mute it's also the next one was probably let's pivot because you just had to change quickly right so that's what we see a lot of um our clients doing if they would normally be at a trade show to launch a huge product that means a lot to their business and a lot to their customers we you know we're pivoting to virtual trade shows virtual press conferences where we can invite the same people that we would have seen on the trade show floor but in a virtual environment so it's just that pivot how, how much of the virtual trade shows do you see as being kind of, um, I'm going to use the term skeuomorphic, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, something that like mimics a trade show, like you get into it and you see like the, you see a little fake trade show hall and you can click on different things. How, how much of that are you seeing uh, versus innovative ways to actually just create a, a completely new experience? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm seeing more, more speaking opportunities like webinars. Mm -hmm. Um, So if a client were to have a speaking opportunity at a trade show, it would just be a webinar instead. Um, I haven't had a ton of experience personally this year with virtual trade shows and events. Like I think in in the terms you're talking about, Um, but I know they're happening. Um, I think people are getting more comfortable with them. Um, you know, one thing I would recommend to clients who have a big announcement that they typically would announce at a trade show is just do something, but on a smaller scale. So maybe do a press conference where you invite press to like, um, a a webinar or like some sort of virtual meeting room where your subject matter expert can talk, show, show the product, talk about it, talk about the benefits And then, you know, afterwards set up some one-on-one interviews with the, with the editors. I think that would be a a good way to pivot from a normal trade show experience. It's been interesting to me. um, You know, you, you mentioned uh, webinars and and speaking and that kind of thing. We had um, in a previous episode, we had Matt Snodgrass from marketing profs and he was talking about how they've shifted with their virtual talks, it, it used to be uh, very much just a virtual version of what you would typically get at a conference, right? Uh, somebody comes out and they and they talk, they, they have their 20 minutes or 40 minutes or whatever. Uh, and then there's a Q&A and they handle that live. And somebody sort of reads questions out to them and they, and they answer them. They've pivoted to asking for all of their sessions to come in pre-recorded and then for the speaker to actually be there in the audience, in that virtual audience, uh, which is really different. It's not what you would expect. It's almost like you've cloned yourself. And while you're giving the talk, 
you can answer individual questions in that chat. Um, and I was like, that's such an interesting development and it feels like sort of a no brainer, but we tend to get locked into our, our previous understanding of the way that these things work. So it was, uh, it was interesting to me to just to see just that one little tweak gives a completely different experience that you couldn't have in a live scenario. Now this virtual webinar, this, uh, you know, whatever it is that you'd want to call it, uh, has a different dimension to it. Um, which, which kind of amazes me. Yeah. I like that. I've not heard of that before, but that's a really cool way to, to make it more unique and more experiential for the people attending. It's not just a passive thing where they're listening to a webinar. They can actually ask questions live and have the expert responding real time. I think that's awesome. Yeah, it would be, uh, it would be sort of, sort of like, um, you know, a uh, uh, like a Reddit AMA with, with Hugh Jackman while you're watching a movie of his, you know, yeah. and you're just asking questions. Um, it, it's just, it, it's an, it's a neat idea. Um, yeah. so I, I'm interested to see what happens with that kind of innovative thinking, you know, in the next few years, as we start to really embrace this more. Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Guys, the limit. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you think, do you see things going back to, to some kind of normal? Do you think we're ever going to get back to, to the way that we, we did things or, you know, do you have a sense of, uh, from a percentage standpoint in your sector, how far, how far we're going to, to revert, uh, to previous ways of doing things? What, what do you think, uh, where do you think we're going to land on that scale? Hmm. That's a good question. I had my crystal ball, Scott, I would say, <laughs> I think it's going to be like a 50, 50 split. I think yep. it's not going to be entirely the same. Like I've heard from people, um, trade shows are going to be different. I don't know if we're going to get that at least not in the next year, um, maybe five years, 10 years down the road, it'll be different. But within the next year, I don't see trade shows being the same as they were. I almost see it being like maybe part of it's virtual and then part of it's in person. Yeah. I don't know how that would work exactly, but like maybe, um, you know, you still have your booth, but any kind of sessions you would go to would be virtual. I could see that, but things are definitely different. I think things are going to be different. And um, the companies that are able to be agile and flexible are the ones that, you know, are going to grow and, and do interesting, innovating, innovative things. Um, so it's definitely an, ex, you know, it's an interesting time to be in PR, um, with all of these changes happening. I, I think it's going to be interesting. The, the companies that I think are going to do well are going to be the ones that, that do, uh, you know, mix the best of both worlds. Um, you know, give you a, a really custom, really great experience if you show up, uh, but create a scenario in which you don't feel penalized if you can't. Um, and I, I think that's going to be interesting. And I think it's also going to increase attendance as well, because if I don't have travel expenses, if I don't have lodging expenses and I don't have meal expenses, um, all of a sudden, you know, $400 or $600 to, to attend a conference instead of a few thousand um, is going to be a little bit easier for an employer to swallow. And maybe they're going to send three people instead of one. Um, yeah. and, and allow, allow folks to, you know, I, I think, I think there's a tremendous opportunity there. Um, and yet they can still be giving incentives for people to actually come and to meet, because I do think that the, to some degree, you're going to be more likely to close a deal if you're doing an in-person thing and arguably not a handshake, but, uh, you know. <laughs> is it, is it going to be like this, like a elbow bump? <laughs> yeah. What do you prefer? Do you prefer the elbow bump or the fist bump? I like elbow now because I'm not a germaphobe, but I feel like that's a little safer. <laughs> yeah, it 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 really does feel uh, novel to <laughs> to a degree, right? Uh, you know, fist fist bumps kind of feel a little 2008. But, yeah, it's uh, a little dated. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I, I think you're right. I think trade shows are going to look different, but I think you know, people are more open to, to doing things in different ways now. Whereas before it was like, you have to be there in person. If you're not, like you said, you'll be penalized in some way. Maybe you won't get the story you're looking for if you're an editor or mm -hmm. what have you. But now there's so many, there's so much going on in the way of technology. That's just going to make it like, like you're there. 
Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of exciting things to come. I think so too. And I'm, I am especially interested in, in some of those hybrid experiences. Um, you know, I'm thinking about the, the fact that, uh, colleges and universities for the last 20 years have been working with, uh, distance learning and, um, you know, online learning. And what I was starting to see as a trend is a lot of students were taking a a 50, 50 or a 60, 40 course load where they would go in person for the classes that they would really need to, um, be present for, you know, lab classes and that kind of thing. But others, uh, they would take online and they have a uh, different freedom in their schedule. So, uh, they, they could end up, you know, not getting up until 10 AM and still, you know, meeting the requirements that they needed to and working late into the night, if that's what they're more comfortable with, um, allows you to work, uh, you know, more flexibly, take a full semester and travel and mm-hmm. still be in school. Yeah. Um, so I think that internship too, like during the day, hundred percent. Yeah. An yeah. internship, you could be in Kansas and go to school in Massachusetts and get an internship in California and not leave your house for days at a time. <laughs> the- theoretically. I mean, th- yeah. those are the kinds of things that can be happening now. And yeah. so you know, I think, I think as people start to think more broadly about it from a PR standpoint, from an event standpoint, um, it's, I'm, I'm going to be, I'll put the word out. I'm expecting to be amazed over the next few years uh, to just see the the creativity that people employ. Uh, So that gives me a lot of optimism that this is going to be a a turning point, I think, for a lot of uh, a lot of industries. 100 percent. Yeah, I think it's going to like you said, there's a lot of room for creativity and people are looking for that. They're looking for new ways of doing things, which gives people like kind of carte blanche to do to do, you know, what they think could be relevant and interesting and, you know, try it out. There's like that fear. I think that fear factor is gone. You can try something new and not be as fearful because we're just all trying to make it work at this point. (laughs) Right. Well, that's actually how we got this podcast. It was, uh, it was, it was kind of on a lark, uh, wondering if we could do it in 24 hours because I was writing a blog post, um, which you've written a number of blog posts as well. Uh, and, and folks, you can go see those at godfrey.com slash insights. Um, but, um, you know, writing a blog post and, and wondering, I don't know, what would it take to actually throw together a podcast when you're stuck at home? And it really wasn't that hard. And, uh, and it, it turned into something that we've really enjoyed doing and, and talking to a variety of different people. Um, so, yeah, it all it took was a little time. And I think that that's going to be a big factor for a lot of people. If you have a little bit of time and a little bit of resourcefulness, um, you might be able to make some, some magic happen, which is, which is cool. Very cool. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. If you had one piece of advice for people in terms of their, uh, in terms of their, their PR efforts, if there's one thing that, that you see people not doing that you really think they should, what would that be? Mm, It's a good question. I would say be creative. Think outside the box. What have you got to lose really? So try to do things in different ways and see what happens. Um, And then one of my very, very first managers gave me this advice that I've mentioned to people that I work with many, many times. And I just want to share it. Um, you know, we can all get kind of stressed out in our day-to-day jobs, but the one thing she said that stayed with me, um, for 15 years has been it's PR, not ER. We're not saving lives. So try, you know, try something different. It's not going to kill anyone. (laughs) So, you know what I mean? So just don't stress it's PR, not ER. You can make, make mistakes if you need to and, and learn from them. So just wanted to share that one. I, I love that. And I've, I've seen you live that. Uh, one of the, one of the things that I've, I've always loved is um, I, I won't get too much into detail with it, but we were, we were at a trade show and you saw an opportunity to possibly break a Guinness world record. And, uh, and so when I came to visit, you were very hurriedly getting in touch with the Guinness people and I was like, I just love that you think that way because it wasn't on the list of things to do. It wasn't in the plan. 
Um, but it was about, it was about having an idea, seeing an opportunity, chasing it down. It ended up not really coming, coming through to fruition, but just as an exercise, I mean, it was really exciting and it, it gave us a sense of, uh, of how, you know, sort of monumental things were that, uh, that our client was, was working on. Um, there was a lot of excitement around that. So you were thinking big and, um, and, you know, even, even if only one out of four things pan out, uh, I think it's worth the effort. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, you've, uh, I, I think you would, you would do your, your original manager proud. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Sure thing. All right. Well, thank you very much, Melissa. It's been a pleasure to chat with you today. Uh, a lot of good insight there and, and I'm sure more things to come. I'd, I'd love to have you back on a future episode. Thanks so much, Scott. This was fun. Me too. Thank you. Thank right. you. Marketing to Complex Industries has been presented by Godfrey, a B2B marketing agency for industries like yours. Godfrey is built for technical products, discerning buyers, and intricate buying cycles. For more information, visit us at godfrey.com.